Welcome El Paso and thank you for joining us for what we're calling El Paso 2021 and beyond. Today we'll be speaking uh, and greeting some very special guests, many of whom we all know because we're a community that interacts with each other on an almost daily basis. And today we join business and community leaders for an interactive online convening to discuss best practices to support business continuity in the El Paso metro region. During this event, you will have the opportunity to hear from our panel of local and national experts who have played a role in helping entrepreneurs both receive PPP funding and support for ongoing business growth in El Paso and beyond. I'll begin by briefly introducing our panelists uh, by name. And the first is Ed Escudero. He is the vice chairman of West Star Bank. Ed has a distinguished career uh, in corporate uh, roles and also is a stalwart of many corporate uh, nonprofit and uh, corporate relationships here in our city. David Jerome is president and CEO of El Paso Chamber. David also has a distinguished career in the United States and overseas across a number of different industries and now lends his skills to the El Paso Chamber. Our special guest is Bruce Katz. He is the Distinguished Fellow uh, at the Lindley Institute for Urban Innovation. He's also the Director of NOAC Metro Finance Lab at Drexler University. Lupe Mares is Vice President of, Southwest, uh, of the Southwest Region at the Lift Fund, a CDFI that works regionally. Prior to the Lift Fund, Lupe had a distinguished career at the uh, Dallas Federal Reserve, the El Paso branch. Joining us as well is Cindy Ramos Davidson, Chief Executive Officer of the El Paso Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Let me tell you that this is made possible through a collaboration between the Aspen Institute, particularly the Aspen Institute's Latinos in Society program, and by uh, the interaction and work of the Woody and Gail Hunt Family Foundation here in El Paso. We're thrilled that we have over 80, 80 business leaders from the El Paso area who are interested in understanding what does it take for business support and continuity best practices in our area and beyond. So at this point, I would like to also welcome Bruce Katz and turn the flow over to Bruce as he sets the stage for us with this presentation. Bruce? Well, thanks, Beto. And, um, and also a, a shout out to the Aspen Institute for, for bringing us all together. And it's great to see everyone. Um, wish I could be there with you. So let me present um, what is very timely information about the state of Latino owned business in the United States and in El Paso. And more importantly, what do we do to stabilize businesses and really start uh, a more inclusive uh, build back uh, as we move forward. So next slide. Um, so this is the pre-COVID uh, starting point um, for Latino and Black-owned business at the national level. Uh, I don't think it's going to be surprising to anyone on this call, uh, even though Latinos make up 18% of the United States population, Blacks make up 14% of our population. The share of employer firms, firms with employees, are uh, much less than the demographic parity would have. What we do at the NOAC lab at Drexel University is we look at three metrics, um, the number of businesses, uh, what, what is really a business density metric, uh, the number of Latino in business, for example, per a thousand Latinos compared to non-Latino owned businesses per a thousand non-Latinos. Then we look at business size and then we look at, look at business sector because what we find uh, really across the board for Latino owned business and black owned business is a low share of the number of businesses by any metric you choose, uh, low revenue 
uh, low payroll, and then concentration in low wage sectors, like let's say healthcare and social assistance or food, restaurants, or construction in many parts of the United States. And so this is the starting point pre-COVID. Uh, next slide, I'll show you where El Paso fits. Um, similar in many respects, though not all respects, in terms of business density, uh, only 7.2 Latino-owned businesses per 1,000 Latinos. Obviously, the Latino population makes up the preponderance of the El Paso population, but you don't see the same share with regard to employer firms. Business size less, but interestingly enough, um, because of the dominance of the Latino population, a little variance from the over-concentration in low paying industries. Um, next slide. Um, so when we looked at where you stand across the United States, um, you know, what we try to do is, is compare you to your real peers. And what we use is a whole series of demographic and economic metrics to locate your peers. We, it's not a dart throwing exercise. Uh, it's really an exercise using um, the ample data that we have. So what, what we find here again is your sort of middle of the pack and, and particularly with regard to the sales of Latino or Hispanic owned firms. And you're ranked 42nd across these multiple metrics um, uh, in the United States. And the reason why you're 42nd is again, because it's on this sales level, revenue level, payroll level that, that you're lagging. Um, next slide. And by the way, the deck will be made available to everyone. And it's based on a um, newsletter uh, and report that we put out yesterday with the Aspen Institute. Then the key here, and this is really a critical point, because in the United States, we've tended to think about the number of businesses. Uh, during the, the presidential campaign, the Democratic primary, former Mayor Mike Bloomberg of New York City famously, famously said, let's double the number of black owned firms, for example. The key is really to focus on sectors because sectors of the economy and your presence in different sectors of the economy really determine whether you're involved in high wage and growth sectors and therefore are able to bring more uh, folks into the labor market and create wealth for business owners. So when you, when you break it down by sectors, what you realize is Latino and non-Latino firms are almost batched together in accommodation and food services and healthcare and social assistance, um, maybe real estate. But when it comes to wholesale trade, retail trade, manufacturing in particular, arts and entertainment, you see a real divergence. And so as we go forward post pandemic, it's really critical to focus on these sector uh, issues because that really is what's gonna determine revenues, wealth creation, employment possibilities. Next slide. So um, everyone on the call, I'm sure is familiar with the Paycheck Protection Program. It was the preferred method by which the federal government provided relief to small businesses in the United States. Going back to March, there was a modification made in June and then another modification made in December, right before the new year. And we're able to break down how El Paso did on PPP, so to speak. And, and you'll see that your average loan was less than the national scale, not by much. Uh, the bulk of your loans are under 150,000. Um, there's a substantial concentration, uh, both in sectors, but also in lenders. West Star Bank really as the, the regional bank is a sort of uh, out performer here. Um, and, and as we all understand with PPP or other lending or investment relationships, networks really matter here. So having a friendly banker um, or having other entrepreneurial support organizations to connect you um, to banks or CDFIs or FinTech firms that are providing uh, the PPP is absolutely essential. Next slide. Um, and what we found across the country 
uh, is that many small firms, very small firms with you know one to five employees or less than 10 employees, they're the ones who really had the difficulty accessing the PPP because what worked for many mid-sized firms was having that relationship, having that person to call, to walk you through the process. And for very small firms, they tend to be underbanked, undercapitalized, and really outside the financial mainstream. So the initial design of PPP favored those who were banked and those who were mid-sized, essentially. And by the way, the definition a small business in the United States is any firm with less than 500 employees. So if you went on the street and you say, hey, what's a small business? Most people would say less than 20 employees, but the national definition is super broad and therefore it, it underserved very small enterprises. Next slide. So what we're doing in Philadelphia because of where Drexel is based is we realized early on that small, very small black and Latino firms were not getting served by PPP. And we did not want to repeat that mistake. So what we have in, in Philadelphia is a coalition of entrepreneurial support organizations, the African-American chamber, the Latino chamber, uh, the Asian chamber, the main business chamber, and a whole slew of community development finance institutions national banks, regional banks, community banks, and FinTech firms. And we're having a surge of support for small firms with bookkeepers and accountants and lawyers to get the paperwork together and then connecting them, connecting them very quickly over to uh, the banks and the lenders. Next slide. The leveraging effect of this is really off the charts because if you, know, if you had a million dollars in a special fund in a city, let's say you had it at the Chamber of Philanthropy or local government, and you gave out $10,000 grants to 100 firms, that's basically what you can serve. But if you just put a small amount of money into getting uh, small enterprises prepared for PPP, you could leverage anywhere from 50 million to over 350 million, uh, depending on how many small businesses uh, particularly apply. So what we have realized during this entire period is the federal government created a product, sent it through mainstream distribution channels, but the real impact is when cities get organized, metropolitan areas get organized with these networks of entrepreneurial groups and banks and small enterprises. That's when you see a small amount provided at the local level, leveraging up large amounts of federal loans. Next slide. So what that really taught us is the power of the ecosystem. And as we go forward post pandemic, and as we think about in El Paso and beyond, how do we grow Latino owned business and black owned business at scale? A, we need some good information. The information I saw you uh, showed you about pre-COVID is a few years old. We need more timely, more reliable, more objective information. But then we need to cohere all these dots, right? Link all these uh, dots. Supplier diversity, what your major corporations, Eds and Meds, or the Feds buy. Local government, is, is the process streamlined? Is it fit to purpose of small enterprises? entrepreneurial support groups, capital access with the right products, commercial corridors where many of these small enterprises tend to co-locate and concentrate, and then sector diversification. How do we begin to lower the gap, the disparities in manufacturing, in wholesale trade, et cetera? Uh, next slide. Well, that's it. So basically, um, you know, this is information which is available from federal resources, it's rarely crunched in this way so that it can be made usable, right, for cities and metropolitan areas. Um, and that's what we're trying to do out of NOAC Lab in collaboration with uh, MasterCard and Accelerator for America. And, you know, from our perspective, if El Paso was able to crack the code on some of these hard challenges with Latino and business, the rest of the country can be fast followers. So, you know, my message today is 
you know, let's use this information to design actionable strategies that can inform and drive change in your own community, but then other places around the country as well. Great, thank you, Bruce. And thank you for spending the time with you and your team and your, and, and, and your, your institution to bring this to our attention. And, and really, I, I think it really opens up a, a whole field of uh, opportunities here. Uh, I'd like to start and kick off by asking a couple of questions. And for our uh, offline attendees or attendees uh, uh, you know, that have joined us, please feel free to type your questions in the Q&A section. Um, and we'll work through uh, getting as many, many of those answered. At the end of all panelists, we will have open Q&A session as well. But Bruce, let me start by asking, we know that PPP is only one tool to support small businesses. What do you think that local leaders in different sectors should be doing to make sure that there is an inclusive small business post-pandemic recovery? Well, Beto, that's a great question because I think coming out of this for a good number of our small business enterprises, uh, they, may, they may be shuttered, they may find their credit ruined, assets depleted, um, and incomes of many of their consumers diminished. Um, and so in a way, what we need to find are new sources of demand uh, for small companies. And so we're intensely focused on supplier diversity because your universities, your hospitals, um, any federal uh, installation, military bases that you have that may be subject to federal rules around spending, large corporations, middle market corporations, utilities in particular, because many of those tend to be regulated at the state level and are required to be transparent about their spend. So we think post pandemic, we need to focus on what, we, what is called anchor procurement and consortia of these larger institutions coming together, uh, setting up uh, intermediaries. Uh, in Philadelphia, it's called the Philadelphia Anchors for Growth and Equity, the PAGE initiative. Uh, in Chicago, it's, it's called the Chicago Anchors for the Strong Economy, the CASE initiative. But set up these supplier consortia um, have them disclose their spend, set their goals, and then really create a market of matchmaking between demand and supply, what the anchors are buying and what black and Latino owned firms uh, can supply. And we think that, that that's what needs to be perfected post pandemic. There's a lot of energy around the United States around buy local. And I, and I think uh, that if, if we can, have a structural change in this direction, supported by the national government, um, I, I think we can begin to crack at a bunch of these numbers. Those are really great points and really great tools and examples you've given us from other communities. Um, I'd like to go back to a little bit of some, some, of, the, some of the study and data statistics that we have here. Uh, it was noted that 83% of El Paso's residents are Latino, but only 40% of the Metro's businesses are Latino owned. How should we be thinking about closing that gap? Well, I, I think it's, it's, it's clear that we, you need to move on the number of businesses um, because the benefits from, from growing more enterprises will be quite substantial for potentially for the owners of those enterprises, but also uh, for the people they hire. Um, and so I, I think it, it partly depends on which sectors um, they, they have low barriers to entry or which sectors with some greater mentoring and guidance and perhaps joint venturing uh, they can enter. So in the United States, the military tends to focus on this quite a bit because they are under federal rules and goals that permit um, joint ventures uh, between white owned firms, perhaps Latino owned firms. Um, and, and that is underway and has been underway since uh, particularly the Jobs Act of 2010 um, under President Obama. So 
I, I think we're going to have to create some new business models here. And we keep doing the same thing we've been doing over the past 30 or 50 years. I'm not sure we're going to make as much progress. But um, so, you know, my message, you know, for, for folks here today is, you know, innovate, experiment, um, you know, and, and, and try to make El Paso the vanguard, um, you know, of, of essentially what needs to be a movement of inclusive growth in the U.S. post-pandemic. I mean, this pandemic has revealed so many inequities and disparities um, across multiple dimensions. So, you know, generally benefits flow to the first movers. Um, and, and I think this is a time where, you know, don't try to boil the ocean, focus on a few sectors on which you can make some progress, but then really focus on the granularity and specifics and the details of how to move the ball here. So I, I hope that's helpful. I mean, you're, you're, you're obviously a, a very special and distinctive metropolis. You're really a binational metropolis. So that potentially could offer up some real opportunities as well. All right, correct. Thank you for that feedback. I'll ask one more question. I believe we have a, another question that I'll ask after that from the panel, uh, from the, the visitors. Uh, my other question is the Biden administration has proposed a $1.9 trillion stimulus and there will be likely be more to come. How should El Paso be thinking about ensuring that Latino owned businesses benefit from federal recovery investment? So um, I would just start getting ready. <laughs> you know, I mean, the federal government, uh, when, it, when it acts during a crisis like this, it'll become like drinking from a fire hose. I mean, every agency is gonna be sending out money through radically different distribution channels. Cities and metropolitan areas are the places where that comes together. And you begin to knit together these ecosystems in the service of broader transformative outcomes like inclusivity or reducing racial and ethnic disparities. So what Colin Higgins and I have recommended is every city and metro set up essentially a recovery center, a war room, articulate your priorities, uh, understand where the federal funding is going to flow. It all doesn't come to city hall. Much of it comes to public authorities, hospitals, universities, you name it, folks will be receiving funding. If it's a competitive grant, start getting those ready. Uh, EDA, for example, the Economic Development Administration, may be getting a $3 billion bump in this $1.9 trillion package. The average annual appropriations for EDA is usually 150 million. So this is a big bump. You could be supporting your supplier diversity efforts with a particular EDA grant. Um, and you could be supporting other small business collaborative efforts through EDA. So I would highly recommend that you set up a recovery center sooner rather than later and start getting your head wrapped around what's coming because it is going to be large it is going to be unprecedented but frankly um, most places will just miss the boat on this uh, because they won't have understood how to align these federal investments to their to their critical priorities bruce that's a really good point and in fact we have a question from our audience that probably encompasses some of that. How can grants be better leveraged by local ecosystem actors to better respond to an ecosystem's unique strengths and weaknesses? Yeah, I think, I think that's really a great question because you know the PPP prep model that we're talking about in Philadelphia, the support that is being provided to these entrepreneurial service organizations like the Enterprise Center in Philadelphia or to the Black or Latino chambers are grants. And what they're leveraging is the PPP, a federal loan product, it's forgivable, but it's a loan product, and potentially uh, other SBA products that might be made available. So what they've done in Philadelphia is understood that a little bit of money grant money, essentially to help bookkeepers, accountants, and lawyers help everyone get their uh, documentation together for PPP, potentially could leverage, as you saw from the chart I used, $375 million in PPP. I mean, the ROI, the return on investment of this is off the charts. 
if you can organize the ecosystem. And, and I think so, so much of this really gets about the, the fact that the federal government tends to operate in these vertical silos. They just send money down through SBA or Commerce or DOT. Localities are more horizontal. They, they more sort of connect with each other, public, private, and civic. That's the power of cities and metros. And when it works, the leveraging effect can be quite, quite large. That's great advice. And certainly thank you for that uh, gentleman that posted that question. We have one more question for you, Bruce, and then we'll move on. And I think this is also quite important. How does the informal economy play a role throughout this? Well, the formal economy is quite large in the U.S., obviously, um, and I think part of the, the question for us as we move forward, there's obviously a lot more sole proprietorships in the U.S. than employer firms, so moving some sole proprietorships over to employer firms, you know, hiring that first worker or second worker is a big deal, but also moving from the informal to the formal economy, right, could be a big deal because you begin to routinize your financial information and then you're capable of accessing, you know, whether it's a federal loan product or private, you know, sector um, investments. Moving from informal to formal gives you that uh, level of documentation and, you know, essentially that's essential, whether it's, in, you know, for, to underwrite a loan or to make an investment decision with some understanding of what the potential return could be. So it's again, it's a, it's a point about leveraging essentially to move you know, to a more routinized in more transparent economy. Great, great feedback, thank you. Um, I, I now like to uh, welcome Ed Escudero and open the floor for him for some comments. Ed, as I mentioned earlier, he's vice chairman of Westar Bank, an important financial institution a member of our business community. Ed? Thank you, Bethel. Um, and if you give me just a couple moments, I would like to go into a little bit of history of Westar Bank. Um, Westar Bank began its journey back in 1990, and that was you know, just after another financial critical time in our country, and has really become one of the region's leading commercial banks. You know, we are committed to driving not only growth, but prosperity and success in our clients, communities, team members, shareholders. You know, we now have over $2.3 billion in assets and employ over 330 uh, team members. And we have branches back from uh, Fabens, Texas, all the way to uh, Las Cruces, New Mexico. You know, in addition to banking, we also have an array of other financial products. We have treasury management, uh, title, investment, and, and insurance. Um, and with this team back, uh, back in March, when the first round of PPP loans, I mean, we really, and, and don't wanna take any credit. It was the credits to be given to our chair and, and uh, CEO, David Osborne, of, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Rick Francis, our president, David Osborne, Lisa Sines, and an amazing team that kind of rallied the troops together to get over 1,700 loans funded. So during the first round, uh, uh, the initial round and the add-on, we uh, total dollar amounts were about $264 million that were distributed. And I think we probably affected about 41,000 employees. Now on this uh, next round or PPP 2.0, we've had about 587 applications processed um, uh, or that have been submitted. About 400 of those have already been processed and that's about $53 million uh, in addition to the initial 264. And as of today, we've already submitted about $91 million to the SBA, which is close to $13 million. And I would tell you, I think it has to do with what we've learned on the first round where locally, nationally, I would say banks weren't really ready. There was guidance that was um, changing daily that was coming in um, and uh, learn how to administer it on the fly, how to get the troops together, how to start the process and really reach out to a lot of our customers to submit this documentation and, and work with their, their clients to, to move forward. I think we have a much better understanding of the program and, and um, 
are continuing to work with our client base and reaching out to them to make sure that those who don't fully understand it, that their relationship manager can explain it to them and, and get that uh, get that loan process as quickly as possible. There's probably not as many people that qualify this this uh, this round just because there's new qualification standards and, and PPP 2.0. However, when we feel that a, a, one of our, our customers or clients does qualify, we, we do what we can to reach out to them and do what we can uh, to, to help them process. As Bruce was saying earlier, what has been critical to this is those who have that relationship with the bank and can help us provide that documentation needed and, and can get that documentation to us as quickly as possible. So that's why moving some of these smaller organizations from informal to formal is so important so that we could they could access these loans, they could pro we can help process them and they could access, you know, the, the capital available at at the at our bank or or other regional banks. Ed, thank you so much. And it, it certainly speaks of the strength of having a, 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 a well-engaged financial institution with deep roots in our community, working and helping uh, local and regional business leaders uh, to take advantage of every opportunity. Something that jumped out at me in, in your, in, in your, in your uh, talk was the word relationship. And that came up over and over again. Um, speak a little bit more how, how a relationship is ideally forged with a financial institution, both in good times and in bad times? Well, as we all know, in good times, it's a lot easier to form that relationship. I mean, you're going out, you're looking for capital. And when, when your business is doing well, it's, it, tames, it tends to be easier to go and reach out and you feel more comfortable reaching out to your financial institutions. But those relationships that you establish during the good times are, are what's critical and what, what is so important in the tougher times, because now you have a relationship with your, your financial institution, you call your, your banker, your, your, uh, your representative at, at the institution, and in our case, Westar Bank, and we figure out a way to, to work with our clients. So you don't wait until it's too late. You work with them. And, and I will tell you, in, in this case, there were so many loans that had to be modified because of the situation we were in. But it was the, real, the relationship that made the difference. It was also that relationship that helped uh, uh, expedite the process. So they already had a, rela a relationship with a, somebody at, the, at, at Westar. They knew who, who to call. This, this individual would tell them what information that we needed. If we didn't already have the information ourselves. So establishing a relationship, long-term relationship with your financial institution is critical to growing your, your, your organization long-term. That's great, great, great advice. Certainly, you know, the, 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 the strength of a relationship in difficult times is really built on the strength of the relationship during good times. That's, that's great advice. Um, with respect to working past PPP2 and into 2021 and beyond, what are some strategies or uh, approaches that Westar is taking uh, that you could share with us? I think what we've learned is how important communication is. It's critical and essential with our employees, with our clients, with our regulators being proactive in, in reaching out to the most impacted businesses in our community to offer any assistance in applying for PPP loans, for providing help in managing their cash flow during these extremely stressful times. Um, and just to help them financially plan and survive for the recovery. So making sure, you know, hate to say, but going back to that relationship, continuing to work on that and, and communicate what you don't wanna do is take back or not not reach out to to the professionals, whether it's at your banks, your your attorneys, whoever it may be, that could help you in the process. I would tell you, I think what we realized early on, and I think what helped the team really at, at Westar come together is we realized that there was two crises here: a healthcare crisis that we were dealing with, and a financial crisis. 
And we felt that we were the first responders for the financial crisis. We had to be out there. We had to be proactive. We had to reach out to our customers. And so that's, that's kind of the, the position we took as, as the first responders. And uh, honestly, I, I, you know, I've, I've consumed a lot of uh, blogs and you know, news on, 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 on the pandemic. And you're the first person that rightfully so identifies uh, the folks at banks as first responders in a financial crisis. I think that's well said. Um, but there are other entities uh, that also interact with businesses in various capacities. And so, uh, David, I'm going to turn to you and, uh, and ask you to, to walk us through some of the activities that the, uh, the, the El Paso Chamber has been uh, promoting and some of the things that you've seen that uh, you know, we can introduce during this panel. Absolutely, thank you. <clears throat> Are you gonna beam up the presentation for me? I sure am. Thank you, my friend. We can go to chart number two straight away. Um, what I would say just very quickly as we sort of kick this off, I do want to thank you, Beto, for pulling this off. This is fabulous. Bruce, very nice to meet you. Ed, wonderful comments, and I look forward to the rest of the panels as well. Um, and also um, the Aspen Institute and, and, and obviously Woody and, and his organization. Um, they do so much to facilitate us all coming together, which is, I think, as Bruce sort of mentioned, we should be horizontal in the city, and I think we are, and uh, it's certainly with the leadership we have in town, uh, it, it certainly uh, keeps everybody thinking that way. Uh, for the Chamber, what I wanted to review today real quick is how we're looking at 2020 beyond PPP, which is, um, I found very interesting um, uh, analysis earlier. And then we'll talk about uh, some of the response that the Chamber has around that. So if we could go to the next chart real quick. Um, the thing about the Chamber, I think, is also just important to level set because sometimes um, we forget what Chambers are for. And we think of the chamber as, and this thinking we think is more important now than ever. A lot of the nonprofits that are on the call today, you know, we're so busy all the time thinking about making sure that we're helping our small medium enterprises in our community. But a great way to think about this, and one of the reasons I like this format so much is, is also the nonprofit world has been stretched by this too. And they play an incredibly important role in getting this done. I'll give you an example. Um, we had, thousands of phone calls, and I'm not unique in this, and how to get help. And I know we track this. I think we sent 900 folks over to West Star Bank. Just why? Because they had seven people processing those loans, and we were sure that the people who wound up there got a good, uh, a good experience. And it was just that straightforward for us. Uh, West Star did a great job, and, uh, and we wanted to make sure that whoever showed up at our door got a good experience. And so that's sort of how that works at some levels. But when we think of the chamber, it's uh, transforming business to improve lives for the El Paso metropolitan region. That's why we're here. And how we do that is we work on connecting businesses, coaching them, advocating for them, and innovating around them. And innovation is a sort of an interesting area for a chamber to sort of pin its hat on at some levels. But uh, when we think about where we want to be, um, you know, coming out of this crisis and where we want to be in 10 years, we think we have a role in facilitating that conversation. Certainly not letting hope be a strategy in that space. Next chart. So when we think about uh, the single biggest frame that we think or the single business biggest question that should be asked of a chamber or any nonprofit that wants to help business this year, we think the question is simple. What are you going to do to help us rebuild and reimagine our economy? And the chamber has a role in that in a couple of ways. Uh, clearly, we have been working to uh, get um, grants out to folks. We think of those as the fish. You know, a lot of that grant work is uh, quite interesting, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But also the poll, in a lot of ways, we think it's important that we do coaching. And in most circumstances, for every person who calls a chamber asking for support in terms of a grant, we have another three that call us asking for business support in terms of coaching. And that area we think is extremely important in terms of creating sustained uh, business uh, resilience, let's say, in this area. For example, a lot of the quality coaching that we were doing to make sure that our members could qualify as suppliers in, in global supply chains by having a good quality certification 
works equally well in terms of resilience training in the context of this, of this crisis. And so that's been a big part of it. And I think the other thing that I would like to um, you know, underline is collaboration is more important than ever now. And um, we all talk about it and we all try to do it. But I think that we have found that the closer we work with the city, the county, the other chambers, uh, Lift Fund and others, the more we've been able to do together. And uh, I think my team, you know, spoke to the other chamber and the Lift Fund and things like that more than they did to me. And uh, so this is a pretty amazing time. And I think it does change models and how we're gonna think about things. You know, coaching's being flipped around to be looking at reskilling a lot more than we might. How do we deal with the accelerated digital everything that we're dealing with, for example. There's a, a lot of things that will change. We get a lot of questions on, you know, how to deal with the distributed workforce, uh, things of this sort. Um, so, um, There'll be a lot of uh, efforts on coaching that I think we don't want to diminish by any stretch. And I love this idea of a war room approach to how we look at things like grant distribution going forward. I think that would be helpful. I think we did a pretty good job at the city and county level this year, but more to be done. And I think better for the future, we can learn from where we've been. Uh, the other thing though, too, is when we reimagine, um, not only do we want to focus on grants and coaching, and those went well in 2020, we'll carry those forward into 2021, but what can we do that would push harder, um, be bolder? I think, um, because I think during a contraction like this, you know, it's easy to get quite defensive. We want to try to flip that around and see the opportunity in this and get people to see the opportunity. What can we do with aerospace and defense to try to develop that in the space, working with UTEP and the skills that they bring there. Um, amazing things being done on additive manufacturing and, and aerospace there. Um, we have an ownership stake in the Stanton Street Bridge, which, you know, in many ways, El Paso is one of the most successful inland port cities in the country. How do we double down on our ports and commerce and trade between the United States and Mexico? And using that ownership stake we have in that bridge as an innovation lab to make sure that we are looking at what digital and just it also aesthetic, more welcoming and kind and just generally, how do we just do this better and set an example for the other bridges? And then finally, um, we continue to be working on big infrastructure projects like I-10, I-10 being the biggest all-weather artery between the east and west coast of the United States, goes right through El Paso. And um, this is very important for trade north, south, and east and west. And, uh, you know, we invest in our infrastructure to make sure that we're in a good position to think of ourselves as an outstanding port city for the next 10 years, right? So I think these are big projects that we want to also push and try to make sure that people are thinking about uh, where do we want to be in 10 years, just not how do we get through this crisis. Next chart. And then finally, um, one of the things that I think is very important is making decisions based on data. And uh, the chamber has an enormous amount of volume that comes through our door right now in terms of contact with business. Now we've always, obviously we're an organization that's I think very old. We've been around for 121 years. We have a lot of members, uh, things of this sort, but the volume and the, the scope of the way things have come over the sort of the, the wall to us this year has just been incredible. And keeping up with that and having the, the scale to do it has been a real challenge at some levels, but it's hugely worth the effort because having data drive decision making has made sure that we understand what the need is and can inform public policy with actual data. And so it's been a it's been a heck of a year. But I just to give you an idea, when the county launched their faster program this year, we went to 1,300 phone calls in two and a half weeks. Now that's a lot for us when we're normally dealing with a couple hundred a month. And so, uh, but this is, um, this is a pleasure to be able to work, an honor to be able to work in this space and help businesses in need. So what we'll be doing in January, obviously, is we'll be tracking the PPP round two. Uh, we'll be looking to support these grants. And most of these grants, are, so you know, are in the area of uh, keeping uh, you know, retention of employees, uh, rent covering, and uh, inventory. And then on the coaching side, we get an awful lot of requests for how to be bank ready, how to get grants and things like that. Um, and in some cases, we're actually filling out applications and providing mentors and doing all these kinds of things that you would expect. 
Uh, marketing is surprisingly very um, big request. Um, people are very interested in being digital and understanding how to you know, market in different ways. Um, in fact, I think some of our most interesting and important work has been helping companies pivot to a digital economy where they used to have a, you know, walk-in sort of customer base. And then finally, financing questions, just generally the kinds of things you would expect. What's a balance sheet? How do I use it? <laughs> things of this sort. So um, uh, this is a, a, a lot to do. Um, we are privileged to be able to do it. And we see the results of working in partnership with everybody on this call. Um, I think this is a great initiative. So thanks for doing it. And uh, that's the chamber in a nutshell, I guess. Great, David, I really appreciate you walking us through that and certainly uh, lots of great work being done. Uh, I wanna kick off with a question that's uh, that's posed here uh, includes you and Bruce. Uh, what does the future of Chambers of Commerce look like regarding responsive ecosystem building? Bruce, paper, wax, scissor, who goes first? Go ahead, please, Bruce. You're muted, sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, I, I would say, um, you know, in the US, we always like to look for examples. So, I would take a look at the Cincinnati Regional Chamber um, because uh, for quite some time that chamber has housed what's called the Minority Business Accelerator, uh, which is um, a group of folks, uh, high capacity, they mostly come out of the banking arena or out of the procurement arena, and they focus on helping black owned businesses over a certain size grow and scale more to get at this challenge we have in the US is that we, we tend to have black and Latino owned businesses concentrated in these low wage sectors and they, they face constraints on their growth. So uh, the Cincinnati Chamber really becomes um, sort of a platform for connecting these firms through the Minority Business Acceler Accelerator with major customers you know, particularly through the large corporations, Eds and Meds, um, and then to capital that's really fit to purpose. Um, and, uh, and they provide the advice and guidance, particularly as these businesses um, scale up to meet uh, uh, procurement demand. So Cincinnati, we've written about it um, at Drexel uh, and through the new localism uh, blog that we host. So I would take a look at that because I think that chamber in particular has, has you know, for 15 years really uh, been focused on a, a range of activities um, to, 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 to basically you know, turn the dial. Well, in addition to the Cincinnati Chamber, um, which we will check out, Bruce, um, I'd invite you to come here and check us out and the uh, Hispanic and the others as well. Um, but I think, you know, the thing is, as I would say about this, this question, just generally speaking, um, the, the, the fate of any organization, be a chamber or otherwise, is going to be very much in the hands of the, the, the boards and the management. And are they relevant and are they stepping into the uh, the breach and dealing with the issues that the community has, and that will be shaped by that community to some extent. I, I know here um, we're very much concerned about how do we rebuild our economy and how do we reimagine it, especially as it pertains to our small medium enterprises. And anything we're doing right now is very much uh, geared to that. But I would say that it might surprise you how we define those projects that we think will help. For example, um, we do have a Black Leaders Committee, we have a, a Pride Committee, we have a Women in Business Committee, we have a Small Business Committee at the Chamber. And I highlight those because these committees come together and they wanna work on something called the Shared Value Initiative, which is how to be green and more diverse. Now, this is, this is a terrific way for folks that are, are younger and more interested in these kinds of issues to be able to be, you know, make sure that their opinions and that they're helping shape the way we um, advise on policy, uh, both to business and government. And so I think there's some, just that alone might surprise people to know that that kind of thing is going on. And so um, I would say for anybody who is trying to figure out if they want to get involved, the easiest way to do that is just come and have a chat with us. 
and see what we're doing. In addition to the things we discussed today, um, I don't want to monopolize the whole time, obviously, on what this chamber is doing, or because or, there are some other speakers that are fabulous as well that you want to hear from. But come talk to us, and, and we'll talk to you more about it. Wonderful feedback and great questions. Um, I now want to reintroduce Lupe Mares, who is an executive with the Lift Fund. It's a CDFI financial institution, if you will, that uh, interacts with a broader set of players. And, and Lupe, I'm going to load up your, your, uh, your slides. Thank you, Beto. Thank you so much. And y'all can hear me okay, right? Yes, we can. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And um, for CD, CDFI stands for Community Development Financial Institution. And we've been around for, well, we were formerly Acción Texas. And now since 2014, we are our own entity and uh, now Lift Fund. And we are in uh, currently are, are headquartered in San Antonio, Texas, but we have a 14 state footprint. Uh, we form, we're now in New York, but we are in 13 different states, including New Mexico and of course the state of Texas and all along the Delta from Texas all the way to Florida. And um, so I cover the whole Southwest region, which includes uh, New Mexico, West Texas, into all the way into Amarillo, Texas. And so um, this region, which was part of my region when I was at the Federal Reserve, I'm very passionate about, as I know a lot of you are aware of. But I had the honor, I, I have to say, that I was able to work those PPP loans when the first round came around. And I was I worked hand in hand with a lot of these individuals, and I have to say that I think you and I had this conversation when you first when you and I first spoke and I told you what I went through with some of, of these small business and I'm talking the very small businesses and um, Bruce you mentioned that you know the average was right around 95,000 well as a CDFI our average was around two thousand dollars five thousand dollars which made a big difference to some of these very small business and i'm talking your one person man shop you know and uh two thousand dollars made a lot of difference for these small businesses and and i was sharing with beto that some of the individuals are not tech savvy and i'm also going to bring up because of where we live that some of these individuals did not speak english it, that was a, a language barrier was, you know, they, they didn't know how to communicate and they didn't know who, who to go to, where to begin, where to start. You know, a lot of these individuals, some of uh, from West Star, GCU, one of our largest credit union here in El Paso, they sent them to us because they were not able to help them and which we were happy to help. And we were, you know, able to help them um, because you know, again, they weren't able to, to upload the, their documents. So what they would do, they would take pictures of them because when it comes to their phone, they were able to take pictures and text those uh, documents to us. And then at that point, we took their, their documents when we were able to upload them and help them. But that, that, is, that, that is the situation. That is where it comes down to where a lot of these small business unfortunately don't have the proper documentation that they need to be able to help them further. And, and that's where the downfall is. They don't have the, they need that technical support to help them. In order for them to sustain themselves, to continue going, they need that technical technical support. Next slide, Beto, please. And so this kind of just shares with you, you know, the average of, of uh, we of course didn't do the numbers that Westar did. Again, we're a CDFI. We helped the whole state of Texas. We received a $25 million uh, grant from um, Goldman Sachs uh, for PPP loans for the whole state of Texas. And we also received some money from um, uh, Credit Human uh, to help these uh, uh, small businesses across the state of Texas into Louisiana. And so 35.9% uh, were female and 95% of that were Hispanic women and 64.91 were male uh, small businesses. Now, of these, you know, like I mentioned, we didn't have the, the numbers that we did with that Westar did here in El Paso, but we did have uh, quite a few small business owned uh, businesses here in El Paso that we were able to help with those uh, PPP loans. You know, um, I remember, and I, I mentioned this to Beto, that a lot of my um, colleagues that from other parts of Texas were teasing me. They said, well, Lupe, what's going on? How come you haven't made any PPP loans? And I said, well, I'm still waiting on them. I'm working diligently with them, trying to work with them, each one of them, 
um, you know, to help them upload that information because they're, that's, that's what's taking us long is just, you know, trying to work with them individually to get them to upload the right paperwork or text me the right paperwork that they need so that we can get their paperwork done. Um, and it took a while before they were able to do that. But once they did and they got the hang of it, they were able to upload most of that information. Now, what we see here in El, El Paso is a lot of um, logistics businesses. We have a lot of truckers. We, we see a lot of uh, one man, you know, again, uh, shops where they, they do a a lot of the transportation businesses, warehousing, transportation, um, um, and that's what we saw a lot of a lot of these PPP loans were in transportation. We had a lot of if they had employees, they were 1099 employees. So those 1099 employees were able to do their own loans and um, apply for their own PPP loan. So um, we did see quite a few of those. Next slide, Beto. Now, I wanted to share, along with the PPP loan, we were able to work very closely, thank goodness, with our municipalities, both with the city and the county. As you recall, at the very beginning, we had funding come in from the city and the county. And we also, uh, later when the, they received CARES funding, we, they were able to work with us and give, give us together, uh, the city alone, over $10 million to help with uh, helping some of these uh, small businesses with grants, up to $50,000 in grants. And, you know, Cindy mentioned earlier today, you know, that these are band-aids because a lot of these individuals also had applied for PPP and they ran, that, ran out of that funding pretty quickly. You know, it was, it was a band-aid. It was, it was enough to get them through for maybe a couple of months at the most, and then they were right back where they started, and they needed more funding, and so they came right back and said, you know, we, apply, we applied for PPP. Is it okay if we apply for these grants? And absolutely, you know, uh, we were even able to deduct some of that, that PPP funding that they had applied for to help them to show the losses that they had during these months of the pandemic. Um, the, the county also helped us with an additional 600,000, as you can see there, for, for some grants. The city of Socorro came through and gave us 350,000 to help those small businesses out in the county. I have to share with you, and I'm sure Cindy can back me up with this, that the county, unfortunately, those small businesses in the county, we struggled. We struggled to get them to apply for these small loans, whereas the, the, the small businesses within the city limits of El Paso were on top of it. They applied for those, those loans, but the ones in the county, we struggled a little more to get them to apply. I don't know whether it, you know, I know the ones in the colonias, and those are the ones that, you know, some of them, unfortunately, these are in unincorporated areas that, you know, didn't have the pri pr uh, proper paperwork. Some of them don't. Um, uh, there's a trust issue there. And so a lot of those weren't sure if we, they, you know, if we were, you know, they were afraid that, you know, are, what are these people doing? Are they, are they telling us the truth? We had the Hispanics and philanthropy come. They wanted to help those small businesses along the U.S.-Mexico border. We had $110,000 and boy, did we struggle to try to help those really small businesses in the colonias. We did a lot of one-on-ones um, -on and trying to help. What really helped us there is that we finally gained the trust of one small business and then from there, that person told other small businesses, and because they trusted that one person, then we got more applications in. But boy, was that a struggle to try to administer $110,000. And these were small loans, I mean, excuse me, small grants of $5,000 a piece. And then, of course, right now we're working with our partners uh, to administer one mil, uh, $1.750 million dollars uh, to um, loans out in the county and in, within the city limits. So a total of 15 million, over $15 million that we have administered through Lift Fund, helping our small businesses. But again, what do we need to do as a community, as partners to help these businesses stay open and sustain these businesses? It's gonna take a lot of technical assistance. Next slide, please, Beto. So this will give you an idea, of course, you know, it's 
it's where we live. 86.2% were all Hispanic. And then, you know, it shows you the demographics there of all the money that we've administered thus far. And, you know, it shows you the, the gender, 52.3% uh, were female, 477 almost even of, of how many have applied. You know, we saw the, uh, the applications too. I mean, I speak to these in, uh, small business owners daily and a lot of times it's their family members that are applying for them. It's not them, it is their family members. It's either either a daughter or son, son-in-laws, daughter-in-law, even their high school uh, kids that are applying for them online, or they may give us permission, they'll sign a waiver where they're allowing us to fill out the application for them because they're just not tech savvy to help us. You know, let me give you an example of one caterer that I know in particular that had to change their whole way of thinking because they, um, they're a caterer. So all events have been canceled. She had no business. And so she took one of these grants that she was able to receive from the county, or excuse me, from the city, and was able to buy a machine to make tamales, for example, so that she could stay in business, keep her doors open, pay her employees. So she made tamales during this, this the winter so that she could keep her doors open, keep, you know, paying her employees, pay her bills and stay open. I mean, these are the things she had to learn how to, um, you know, pay, uh, excuse me, how to do digital media so that she could promote her business and, 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 you know, really sell her, her tamales online. It's been very, very hard for her to be able to, um, uh, you know, to keep her doors open. Next slide, Beto. <sighs> Some of the money that we have received thus far is for technical support alone is from Walmart. We received $50,000 and from the El Paso Electric Com Company, $15,000. But again, I can't stress enough how important it is for the technical support side of this, how we need to all, again, come together as a community, as David Jerome was saying, as all of us have been saying, how we need to work together with these small businesses to help them to you know, um, sustain themselves and have that proper paperwork to be able to help them. And, you know, with any type of grants or loans or anything that they may need to stay open. Thank you, Bethel. You're muted, Bethel. Thank you. Really <laughs> appreciate your perspective. Uh, you know, you're, you're, you're you're, you're, you're a different kind of financial intermediary, if you will. Correct. Uh, speak to us a little bit of some of the best practices. You're part of a larger organization. Some of the best practices that have been brought to bear and examples of how CDFIs or similar institutions have been leveraged in other parts of the country. You know, thank you so much. You know, what we do a lot of, and you know, we're those the ones that take the higher risk. Uh, for some of these um, um, small businesses. We are the ones that if a financial institution don't, doesn't want to take a risk on, a, on um, a small business, we're the ones that do take that, that risk. And we work with them because our goal is for them to go to the West Stars, to go to the GCUs at some point. You know, we want to graduate them and have them build that relationship with the West Star so that they can continue to grow, so they can create those jobs. That's our goal. That's what we want. But you know, and during these hard times, we want to help who we can. And, and we've seen it all, Beto. We've seen it all. But our goal is that we do a lot of handholding. We do a lot of, of, of that technical support that, you know, typically when they're with a, a West Star, when they're with a GCU, they don't need that because they've already graduated. They have what they need already. They've, you know, they're they're doing well. Um, but when they're still with us, we're doing a lot, a lot of coaching, a lot of handholding holding. Uh, even when with, they're with the chambers, they're a little more graduated than when they're with us. When they're with us, they're at the very basics, 
you know, they're still at the, you know, you can go talk to them. They're still got all their numbers on ledgers or right here. They can tell you, I can tell you what I made in January. I can tell you what I made in February, but they don't have it written down anywhere else. And so that's, that's who you're working with. And, and we need to, we, but you know, I, the way I see it is they have a job. They don't need any government assistance. They have a job. They're working very hard and, you know, they keep growing and then they create another job for somebody else. And, and so forth, you know, and, and they can become successful. There's no reason they can't. It's just helping them. Thank you, Lupe. You've given us a great viewpoint and basically uh, a great landscape of what we're talking about. We're talking about, you know, very small businesses. And as Bruce and others have pointed it out, an incorporated business informal economy moving quickly into the formal economy. And it points out how important it is to uh, as you put it, graduate them from one aspect to another so they can be, become part of the formal economy. And it's not just to be part of that economy for the sake of you know, uh, business growth, but it's also during times of difficulty, having access to the formal routes that are existing, you know, the banks, the different organizations, the federal programs that help the businesses uh, weather through. And uh, I, I now like to introduce our, our, our panelist, Cindy Ramos Davidson, who I know has spent lots of time helping mentoring and ushering resources to a number of important businesses in our community. Cindy. Thank you so much. I'll try to make this quick with the time you have. I've got a lot of slides. So I think what we'll do is we'll just give these to you and you could add them to the slide deck if that works all right. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, Bruce, it's nice to meet you. I've watched you many times on the Brookings Institute and uh, Jennifer Rodriguez is a counterpart of mine in, in your area at the Hispanic Chamber there. Nice to meet you. Um, it, either leave me go to the next slide. Uh, I'm just gonna talk real quick like here. The chamber is kind of a unique element in this market as it goes with chambers across the country. You do not have to be a member to access the three logos on the bottom. We are very privileged to say that we manage the Women's Business Border Center, which is in partnership with SBA out of DC. It is 20 years old. We also manage the Minority Business Development Center, which is in partnership with the US Department of Commerce. And we've had that center for uh, uh, 13 years. And our newest center is our Minority Women's Enterprise Diversity Center with Commerce Department that we have managed now for three years. So those three technical assistance centers that we operate allow us to bring lots of resources to our community as a chamber to anyone who needs help without ever being a member. Years ago, when I went to, um, came to the chamber, one of the things that was happening is businesses would come in into the door wanting help and we couldn't help them because they weren't a member. And I just did not feel like we need to do that. So very early on, I was able to convince the board that we needed to diversify our people, our products, and our process to be able to help businesses find new sectors of customers, but that we needed lots of resources to do that. And thus was the birth child of those three centers. If you could go to the next slide, please. Uh, go to slide, um, the next slide, go to our impact. This is one of the things I wanted to share with you that we're very proud that we do in the marketplace. This economic impact statement is a collective data of the work we've done here in El Paso for our businesses, which are, as you know, predominantly Hispanic. We have counseled 18,426 clients from December, from January 1 of 2003 to December 15th of 2020. I'm gonna talk about our COVID year. You can see here our clients that have participated in our training sessions and the financing projects that we've assisted and the procurement matches that we have been able to procure because we are state hub certifiers as well as national women's ownership small business certifiers. We have helped 32,000 uh, startup businesses. We've helped 35,000 businesses get assistance. We've helped create and retain 67,000 jobs. 50,000 female clients, almost 1,900 service and veteran disabled clients, and 1,963 home-based businesses for a total economic impact from January 1 of 2003 to February 15th of 2020 of $2 billion, all of it through our offices, sweat equity, truly in and out 24-7. Uh, next slide, please. On this slide, I wanted to kind of highlight, this is COVID year. We were like everybody else, 
we locked that door on March 13th and we went at it with technology. And thank goodness that we were in that space to be able to do that because we're not sure what our businesses we've been able to do. So we started doing training using Zoom, what applications work, telephone, anything we could use technology to connect with our market. In this COVID year from January 1st to December 15th, we have been able to service 3,418 clients we've counseled. 4,566 of them have participated in training sessions. We've been able to help them connect with the financing entities in our market with a total of $144 million, $415 million in contract opportunities at both federal, city, state, county, and private sector levels. We've helped 1,900 startup businesses, 1,600 we've helped them get expanded. We've helped create 14,000 jobs and retain them. 1,500 female clients, 103 veteran and service disabled, and 95 home-based. And this is in a COVID year to $171 million, but the need is greater. If we could go to the next slide. Um, and the next slide. You can see that we've already lost 27.6 of our businesses in this market because of COVID. If we could go to the next slide. The next slide. I don't want to go consumer spending. We know that the impact right now is our downtown businesses are really hurting. You know, 30% of spending is done by Mexican nationals who cross the border and our downtown businesses are so dependent on that retail trade. So COVID hit them and then the closure of the business even hit them more. Um, and many have closed due to the decline of the Mexican shopper. Next slide, please. Um, I have a gentleman here and he was allowed us to put his name. I had to go. Um, more, he had to let go more than half of his employees. I needed to adjust my business in order to save money. I've been sur surviving out of my own personal savings and I don't believe I can keep my business open if the border remains closed to non-essential personnel. And he's one of those that was dependent on that market. Some of the challenges that we've seen because when we shut those doors on in March, we went at it immediately. Our business was ready hearing about coming and we wanted to make sure they were ready and we were ready. But the challenges that we had mentioned are great. No matter what level of business, your smaller mom and pops have it harder, but even your mainstream businesses, because sometimes they don't have all their stuff in a box that they can readily go after. Lack of technology, lack of resources, no social media. Many of the small businesses are extremely financially fragile. And if they have not already established their relationship with a banker, even more so. Um, you can tell that the most of the businesses that we have been counseling only had two weeks of cash on hand. And the majority of them were small businesses uh, and very concerned about how they were going to survive and thrive, especially in this COVID world. Next slide. Here you can see the challenge of small businesses not having proper bookkeeping, access to the information and technology, lack of program understanding and documentation. Even some of our more sophisticated businesses like the Don Coco restaurant who was approved uh, through the PPP uh, for their 11 locations, really did struggle to get everything together. Uh, she came to us and we helped them do it for her to get her business, to get her money. But many businesses in our community that did apply, work with us, that we helped guide, did get their money from one of the lenders in El Paso. Next slide. Uh, our Paycheck Protection Program with the Chamber in terms of Texas, you can see how many businesses that received it and how much dollar amount that is. That's data you can get anywhere. If you could go to the next slide. Uh, we just did a current survey of our members. 42% responded said they weren't sure if they were going to even able to rebound after COVID shutdown orders. 41% of respondents said they were not able to because they were struggling paying operating expenses. I will tell you uh, that many of our smaller companies, especially those in the county, are three, four, five, and six months behind in paying rent as well as utilities. Um, and so they are really trying to figure out how to get out of this. So that's when we talked about put a Band-Aid. We don't need Band-Aids. We need to figure out how to help them and then put the whole, the whole thing together so they can continue to survive and thrive. If you look at this next slide, thank goodness for our partnership with the city of El Paso, uh, the county of El Paso, through our technical assistance centers. We were able to do our Main Street, Small Street assistance program. There were two elements of that. We gave out safety business kits so that people could start understanding how they were gonna to need to protect their business with all the safety protocols. So we gave them a thermometer and we gave them gloves and hand sanitizer and the little stickers for the floor so that they could start implementing in that in their business. 
Um, we also then had another part of that, which was grant dollars, the county's grant dollars in terms of what they were able to use those grant dollars for. We are very blessed today with the County of El Paso that we are so all partnered on the FASTA program. We have two elements of that. One is commercial assistance and the other one is um, being able to provide PPP elements to kind of transform their company from a basic business to a PPE business. So it's $1.5 million. Today we gave out checks with businesses today from the county and many of them cried because it was just just a little bit for them to help them kind of get over a hump again. Um, 125 trainings that we did, small business loans, grants and assistance, and then of course 3,418 business owners, have, you know, have we've served through, through that element. Next slide. Um, overall grant dollars that we've awarded to small businesses is $1.4 million, which is a whopping amount for a short period of time in a COVID year. But I will tell you that during the first round of the PPP, a lot of the businesses had a really hard time um, understanding how to the information, how to gather it, the documentation that was necessary. Um, they had no guidance from a lender because they didn't have a relationship with the lender. Um, and it has been very challenging for many of them. People were trying to keep their employees and some had cash on hand to open, others didn't. The majority of the businesses that we were seeing were sole proprietorship. 51% of them were women owned and the other percentage were men owned. We are finding that right now through our Women's Center, we are having a high turnaround of women wanting to start a business because they have been the most impacted as the caregiver at home, doing the virtual learning with their students, not being able to work out a deal with their employer. So they're trying to figure out how to take what they have and turn it into a business. The ones that have really been hurt in our marketplace are your event planners, your catering companies, your hair salons, your small business restaurants, those independent contractors who just don't have an, a, an access to anything else to help them. They've tried to apply to many of the loan programs because of the fact that their credit's bad, they don't have all the requirements that are necessary, they just don't feel like they have a lifeline. So these grant programs that have been able to be used for utility and back rent and some of those things have been really, really very much instrumental. And like we know in our marketplace, if you don't speak Spanish, you're in trouble no matter where you go. And especially in the county, um, they're the most hurt. We've heard so many sad stories about how some of these young kids have had to go to the McDonald's out there, one of the places that has Wi-Fi because they don't have access to their homework. I mean, the stories are really tough when it talks about infrastructure in those areas, which is broadband. Um, and I could go on and on, but I know the time is tight. It's five minutes after one. I was the last speaker. Nice to be on with everybody. You can tell we've been hitting this very, very hard. Um, we're very blessed because we do have our technical assistance centers, which are SBA, MBDA, and um, our partnerships with the city, the county. Um, and thank you for the time. Cindy, Cindy, thank you so much. I think you've covered not only just great work that your chamber is doing, but the interaction and the partnerships that exist with folks that are not just on the panel, but beyond. And uh, really what it brings us to is a point of decision-making. And in fact, uh, we'll queue up some, some polls if they haven't been done so already for the uh, audience members. Uh, but there were a couple of questions that were floated and you touched on it. Uh, the disproportionate impact to the female entrepreneur, the female employee, right? Because the burden oftentimes of education and maintaining a household falls on them. Uh, a corollary question, a related question was childcare. What can we do? And maybe that's a call to action for our community. What can we do as schools start to open up, we want to get people back into the workforce. Um, and I open it up to all panel members uh, for discussion and ideas around that. Well, there's lots of resources already in El Paso, but there needs to be more. And there needs to be more resources that are available, available and accessible to different parts of the city. You know, we're a very transient community. Get in your car and you got to drive. And so it's got to be in places in the neighborhoods. There should be neighborhood child care centers that are supported by the government, I guess, or private sector if that's possible, so that these young women and, and more mature women have an opportunity to be able to, to do what they have to do. It's really, really, really sad to see the stories and hear the stories of the women that have come in here that have had great opportunities to build their career with companies 
but a company can't keep them for a lot of different reasons. And they had to give that up because they had to play uh, childcare, and especially those that are heads of households, because many of our families, unfortunately, do come from, you know, uh, heads of household where it's just the wife or, and that's all they've got in the family or the grandmother. And so um, it has been a real challenge to try to help guide these businesses and get them the money and, and the support. And I would love to see some child care centers all across. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, uh, David, you know, uh, you, you show some great uh, uh, aspects that your team has working on the chambers working on in terms of innovation and I love it I love the way that you're you're infusing that in some of the work that you're doing um, what innovation project related to economic resiliency do you wish you had resources to work on but haven't because you're still identifying where the resources ought to come from well one of them I guess that I would just highlight um, in that regard we didn't list them all because, you know, obviously it's, you just have a certain amount of time, but uh, I will phrase it this way, timing is everything, right? And right now, thinking about Wi-Fi is ubiquitous and free throughout the community is something that we think the time is right for. Um, <clears throat> it's hard to do, it's complex, it requires money. But when we look at um, the number of students that are having a hard time uh, and these are my future employees, obviously, uh, for our members and things. And so we want to make sure they can uh, get on and, and, and get educated online. And it's very hard if you have to be parked outside of a library to do so, because that's the only place you can fry, find uh, free Wi-Fi. So uh, we think this should be uh, ubiquitous. It's something that is uh, pushed quite hard in the city and the county right now. And um, the other thing that we do think is that um, it, this also would be a boost to these very small businesses that every penny matters to in, in such a, a desperate way at this point. So, and then the other thing that I think is not inconsequential either, I think we'd be the first city in the country to do so, which is very good for the El Paso brand. There's a lot of good reasons we think to push something like Wi-Fi, um, but uh, that's just one that I think um, is, is capital constrained and it would be very good to, to push on. Now, I'm not saying it's the most worthy, you just, it's the one that came to my mind though, when you were talking about capital. I, I would say, and, and caution to add that, um, you know, uh, think about all these projects and make sure we do the highest, best use. And there may be others that rise to the occasion above this, but I do think this is one that, uh, that I do think needs some money to move. And if we did so, it would have high uh, results. Wonderful, I appreciate that. No, so it's an infrastructure call to action. And there's also some structural call to action. We just launched a poll. We had half of the respondents say, we need to invest in workforce development and training programs, right? And I would say this would include taking people from the informal economy to the formal economy, from the formal economy to a, a growth mindset. And those are things that uh, uh, our panelists are certainly collaborating on. Um, I'd like to now open it up for uh, closing thoughts from uh, each of the panelists. Lupe, I'd like to begin with you. Thank you so much, Beto, and thank you again for putting this together. This was great. And, you know, I think as David, I'm going to relate to what uh, David was saying earlier that I think we've, 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 we've done a great job starting, you know, putting coming together as a community, as partners and working together to help our community, our local shops are, you know, really, you know, we keep saying this to shop local, help our, our local uh, businesses. It's so important. We have to continue doing that. And um, just pulling together and help these businesses stay open and sustain them, you know? Um, I can't stress enough that technical assistance and finding those that funding to help them you know with with that technical assistance it's so important um we we've done a lot of that we need to continue um and and just you know especially those one-man shops that you know don't have time to pull away a lot of these individuals don't have time to you know stop what they're doing to listen to you know, get on their computers, or if they even have time to do that. Some of them, we just have to go visit them and sit down and work with them one on one. So we have a lot of work to do. And it's a call to action that we all need to do. So greater collaboration, we just launched a second poll, 
And by and large, 85% of the respondents are saying foster better collaboration models between business government and the education sector. Uh, greater ways to basically bind together. Ed, Absolutely. some thoughts? Sure. And let me go back to a question that, that was posed a little bit earlier in regards to opportunity to grow our, our region. You know, I, I really look at our region as these main three segments, the milita military, Mexico, and manufacturing. And in the manufacturing segment, we know that about, you know, $40 billion a year of, of inputs are put into this manufacturing hub where the, the, this region is, is the fourth largest manufacturing hub. Um, uh, and, and we don't take advantage of these inputs. These, this $40 billion, only 2% of those $40 billion are sourced locally. So this huge opportunity for us to look at, to invest in, to, as we're looking at training and, and growth opportunities, is to grow that 2% of inputs into this manufacturing area and really grow that. I would tell you, and Lupe has said this, and this has been said a lot throughout the day, focusing on the relationships and the collaboration between all the different institutions. We at Westar stand prepared. We have a team focused on getting ready to, to help any way we can. Any opportunity that we have to be able to pull these uh, federal dollars and, and give them to our clients to, whether you're a current client or somebody that, that uh, we can help, we're gonna be there standing ready with a team prepared to do this. So, so um, anyway, that's uh, my thoughts for the day. Did again wanna thank you, uh, Beto and the rest of the panelists for, for doing this. I think this has been great and very helpful uh, for our future, uh, for our future. Thank you, Ed. I mean, I, I, I'm, 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 I'm here in shock. You know, I'm, I'm usually, I'm usually the wardsmith in a room, but uh, I've never heard anyone say military Mexico and manufacturing to succinctly provide a strategy and a focus. I appreciate you doing that. Uh, David, some words uh, of encouragement of how we, we move this along for El Paso's future. Well, I, I guess I would say this, that um, first of all, just to stipulate what Ed said and Lupe, I think, and you and, and Cindy as well. Um, uh, working together is, I think, um, very, very important in this community right now. And people are doing that. And uh, it, it's, uh, it's improving our lot dramatically, I think. You know, it's very easy during these times to be uh, focused on how difficult COVID is. And we need to be. And we need to be making sure that we understand how excruciating this is for these small businesses that are really struggling to, 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 to move forward. But I think it's also important that we do think about moving forward and how we rebuild and how we reimagine this economy. And I have to say, in terms of communities, it's it's very funny to me. You know, it's I often am told things like, you know, I, I wasn't born here and the long generations of people been here forever. I just want to remind people that I was smart enough to choose it. And part of the reason I say that is because this is a really super dynamic uh, community with so much advantages. We're next to the 15th largest economy on the planet. We have a wonderful uh, workforce. And this COVID is a, a natural disaster. It's not a financial slump. When it's over, I expect things to bounce back. And we need to be ready for that. And we need to be thinking that way too. So yes, of course, we've got to get through this. We'll do that together. Let's make sure that we're also together as we craft the future for ourselves as well, because it should be extremely bright. This community is fabulous. Wonderful. Wonderful. Our friend Bruce, unfortunately, had to log off. We want to thank him and his staff. But uh, uh, and I also want to thank the Aspen Institute and uh, the Woody and Gail Hunt Foundation. Uh, Cindy, bring us home with some thoughts of encouragement. Oh, let me tell you what. El Paso entrepreneurs, business owner, live in the world of possibilities. They create them. You could not find better business owners all across this country. They're here in El Paso. Why? Because they're minority. Why? Because they care. Why? Because they're passionate and because of the fact that they love what they do. They've just been hit by a hurricane. Our job is to help them get out of that. And so what we're trying to do, and I can see everybody, is about building trust among partners. If we have to build trust among partners, can you imagine about our small business committee building trust among us? And it is about relationships. 
It's about getting to know people's thoughts, ideas, and soul because of the fact they are very prideful. You know we are, that's just our culture. And all the ones that we have been counseled have not wanted to ask for help. We have had more people cry that in the 19 years that they've built their business, this was the first time they had to ask for help. It does not make them less than, it makes them more than because they were able to say, this one time I gotta get some help. Whether it's counseling, whether it's money, whether it's connection, whether it's a referral, and there are resources in the community to help them do that. The bigger challenge from all of us, there are so many resources. How does the small mom and pop know where to go? How does the small mom and pop know where to start? It's almost like a rat in a maze. So we have to figure out how to help them go through this maze because ultimately we will all succeed whether they scale up, whether they restart, whether they rebuild or whether they start new. I think we all have a moral obligation to play in that role before I get too old and not win the lottery and go to Las Vegas. <laughs> Thank you, Cindy. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I think it's uh, well said. You know, uh, we should continue to develop the and foster the refrigerator rights in each other's community and homes and businesses so that uh, we can build a more resilient town, a more resilient El Paso, and we can have an El Paso that gets uh, better and stronger uh, 2021 and beyond. Thank you to the STT Foundation for allowing us to put this together and host it through, through, their, through, their, uh, through their assets. Thank you again to the Aspen Institute and to the Woody and Gail Hunt Foundation. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Beto. Thank you all.